I am a law professor in San Antonio. I did do 20 years in the Army. I was the senior legal advisor to the U.S. Army Special Forces, so, um, and now I've been a law professor for 16 years in San Antonio at St. Mary's University School of Law, which is the best law school in San Antonio. I cannot be contradicted about that because it's the only law school in San Antonio. Uh, I am a conservative law professor. I know that um, because um, I was asked a few years ago to debate the president of the ACLU, Susan Herman, who is a law professor at, uh, at the law school up in New York, and I debated her behind enemy lines in Boston at the law school there. And I started out my comments. The, the audience was uh, probably about 200 uh, ACLU folks from subunits all over the Northeast. And I uh, you know, started out by saying that never have I seen such a, a gathering of intellectual output since Thomas Jefferson dined alone. Um, now, of course, that would not apply to this group. Uh, we've had two excellent speakers this morning. It's really hard to follow that, uh, uh, that, that amount of uh, education that we've received in such a very short period of time. But a couple of things that struck me, because my topic is, is more um, not so much of a micro aspect, but more of a macro aspect. Um, it, it's all about the people. Robert E. Lee said that when virtue is absent from the people, the nation will collapse. Um, many countries around the world have adopted our Constitution almost letter for letter. I've traveled all around the world in the military. I can say my friend is buying in about 10 languages, particularly in Latin America. And they wonder when it doesn't work and they have to rewrite their Constitution for the 17th time, well, why doesn't it work? Uh, it's not the words on the piece of paper, it's the people. Uh, and that's the issue. When our founders got together and they just said to themselves, you know, we, 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 we want our independence. Um, and of course, in order to gather independence and to gain independence, you're gonna have to fight for it. Because power loves power. As Lord Acton said that, um, you know, power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Their premise when they started to draft the Constitution, what we've heard about today, was that man is no damn good. I mean, that was basically their premise when they started to draw this thing up. They recognized certain principles, and I always, you hear people say, well, you know, our, our country is based on the Bible, and we're a God-fearing nation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I also teach a Bible class at our law school five times a week, and I am a strict constructionist, so I go line by line, word by word, from the original languages. And I sometimes have people say, you know, I've been to a Bible class a couple of times, and the Bible just doesn't seem to work. I still have these problems. No, the Bible works fine. You don't work. <laughs> the same with the Constitution. Constitution's a wonderful document. Um, but if you're a conservative, which I assume all of us in this room are, you're a strict constructionist. And therefore, words have meaning, as so, was so eloquently pointed out by our last two speakers. Words have meaning. And we want to know what the words mean. Now, another bit of uh, news that I tell my students, and they, they don't like this, but it's reality. No one has ever had an original thought, and you never will. You tell me what your thoughts are, I'll tell you where they came from. <laughs> you know, we can go back to Solomon 3,000 years ago when he said, there's nothing new under the sun, folks. And again, that was 3,000 years ago. Now, yes, we can invent a better widget, but the basic philosophical underpinnings of mankind They've been around from day one. Cain and Abel stuff, I mean, it's always there. You're a socialist, I'll tell you, you know, who wrote these things way before you were born. You're a capitalist, we can go into that as well. We can go back, you know, not too long ago to John Hobbes, Thomas, um, uh, excuse me, uh, Thomas, uh, John Locke and Thomas Hobbes, Rousseau and other people, and you know, they kind of put these things down in writing. But before there was writing, these ideas were around. The issue in life is what? You hear both sides and you decide which side of the fence do I want to identify myself with. That's it. The problem with our current society is we don't get the other side. We just don't get it. Uh, a lot of my criti uh, critics, when I, when I, you know, I obviously, as I said, I'm a conservative, so I put out conservative ideas. They say, well, Atticott, you, you don't give the other side. And I tell my critics, you live in the other side. <laughs> you don't hear this side. It's very rare that you hear this side. Um, and so it's the people that's the issue, as Robert E. Lee correctly uh, you know, pronounced many, many years ago. It's, it's the people. 
Now, again, when we say that our founders had certain premise, a certain premise that man is no good, they, they decided, well, what type of government do we want to form? Obviously, it's one of limited power. We just fought against this, uh, you know, the concept of big government. And, uh, oh, oh, by the way, how do we win our independence? With guns, with violence. And it's really amusing to see the news media, which is obviously far to the left. I've done over 4,600 media interviews from every media outlet you can imagine. And, uh, yeah, they spin the news tremendously. And, and Donald Trump, you know, he's, he's a Yankee. He's from New York. You ever see that movie, My Cousin Vinny? <laughs> Where the guy goes, I shot the sheriff or I shot the clerk? And he writes it down. Well, that's a confession. No, it's just how they talk. Uh, and so one of his latest things, he talked about the Second Amendment. He said, well, the Second Amendment, people can do something. And they just went into, you know, the ozone. Oh, my golly, he's calling for the assassination of Hillary Clinton? No, he's not. Actually, he's speaking a very fundamental truth, because my brain, when I heard that, I immediately went to the foundational elements of the Second Amendment. The reason we have the Second Amendment is precisely why my great-great-granddaddy was able to pick up his gun. We didn't have the Second Amendment at that time, but it was a natural right, and fight the British. Uh, he exercised a God-given right. And I love these people that say, well, the war between the states settled the issue about secession. You, you can't do it. Really? Uh, it's a God-given right. I don't care what group of people get together or some old buzzards on the Supreme Court say this or that, because there's a Texas case that occurred after the war. I don't really care what you say. Doesn't matter. You cannot usurp a God-given right. It's a natural right. For you, those of you that don't like the concept of God, it's a natural right. Uh, I like the concept of God because I may, you know, I've lined up on that side of the fence. Let me just put it that way. Um, and so you can't take away a natural right. I don't care if every single judge or jurist in this country said, well, this question settled. No, it's not. No, it's not. But I do agree with one thing. You can have a right, but if you don't have the means to enforce that right, it's like my great-grandmother used to say, and her dad was in the 2nd Alabama Calvary. She said, honey child, you can wish in one hand and spit in the other and see which one fills up first. <laughs> she was from Butler County in Alabama. Uh, so you've got to have the power to enforce your God-given rights, because I'm more concerned with God-given rights, because we know that uh, lawyers are weasels. I know we got a lot of lawyers in this room, but you know, most of them are weaselly critters. They, they come out and they take positions and they try to represent their clients, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But there's a couple of good ones, I'm sure, but there's weasels in every profession. But then again, it goes back to our premise that man's no good. And we could all raise our hands. Oh, I'd never do that. Really? Let me put a microphone on you for like a day. And let's see what you say in the privacy of your own home. Trump just says, says it out in the open. You know, he says what we say all the time. Oh my golly, you can't say that. Now, of course, words have meaning. And I, I have a law degree from the University of Alabama. I've got an LLM from the University of Virginia, which is the best law school in the South. I think they're number seven in the nation, but I don't really care about the rest of the nation that much. <laughs> I've even got an SJD from the University of Virginia. Well, that's five years beyond a law degree from the University of Virginia. Uh, I'm very overeducated, but I love my military vocabulary because it communicates. You can tell people, you know, let's ambulate up that precipice. And people like, what? You know, Get your blank up the hill. <laughs> we got that. I, I like simple language. It communicates a lot better. But I can use the professor stuff and go on and on with prepositional phrases that, you know, just never end. Uh, but in very simple language, again, the premise was man's no damn good. Therefore, we've got to set up a system of checks and balances. The Second Amendment was to guarantee our right in case one day we need to do this all over again. Because if you look at the rise and fall of nations, they last about 200 years. And that's about it. Why can't they survive longer than 200 years? And that's from a historian by the name of, I think his name was Teitler, Francis Teitler. He said the average age is about 200 years of great nations. Well, what causes them to collapse? Actually, they flunk the prosperity test. It's not adversity. Adversity makes people strong. The Great Depression turned out a fantastic generation that won World War II. They know the value of a dollar. Today, we've got morons and dead weight from, from, you know, from sea to shining sea. And when those people that are conservatives, we carry that dead weight on our back, ladies and gentlemen, and when that weight gets too much, we will collapse and the nation is gone. 
It's just gone. And that's just the way it is. Um, because prosperity brings what? They forget where this stuff comes from. They forget the basic concepts that made us a great people. Um, and so where are all these biblical, what are these biblical concepts? Well, there's two themes in the Bible. One are basic establishment principles. Now, they don't get you into heaven. But if you follow these principles, you can have a healthy life and a great nation. The second category of truth in the Bible are, you know, how do I go from here to eternity? So let's not talk about those issues, although I'll be happy to discuss it offline. Let's talk about the fundamental principles, we call them establishment principles, that make nations great. They can, these can be nations that don't even believe in Jesus Christ as their Savior. They can become great nations if they follow these basic, there's four basic pillars that, that make any nation great. That's what they pulled out of the Bible. The first one is the principle of privacy. Privacy is a biblical principle, absolutely. The Bible is interested in individual sovereignty, individual decisions. What, as, Joseph, as Joshua said, me and my family are going to do this. What are you all going to do? You know, it's your right to make decisions. Now, socialism, of course, the state is everything. We're some type of a utopian body, and we all, uh, you know, swap spit together, and we're all going to do what's good for the community, et cetera, et cetera. Uh-uh. That's not the biblical point of view. It's privacy. The number one element is the person. And, of course, these people are arraigned uh, in states at the time, so we call these states rights. But really, they're individual liberties of people within the state, because if you don't like your state, you can move to a different state. Find a state that you like. There are conservative states. Come to Texas, but please, if you come here, I live in Texas, do not bring, do not infect us with your liberal nonsense from California. <laughs> we don't mind if Yankees come into the state, but please, please don't bring that stuff with you. We've seen that in Florida already. In Northern Virginia, it's occupied Virginia now. Uh, because they come down with their ideas. It's, it's amazing to me. These people leave New York because of the taxes and all the socialism. And they come down here with the same virus and infect the people in that state with the same nonsense that they just left. It's incredible. Uh, it's, it's very schizophrenic. So as an individual, I can go from state to state to state. I'll find a state that I like. As Davy Crockett said, you know, you all can go to hell. I'm going to Texas. <laughs> and there'll always be a Texas somewhere or an Alabama or a Mississippi. Uh, but it's a shrinking pivot. So privacy is a fundamental principle that our founders recognized. That's the core element that makes people great, makes societies great. The second core element was capitalism. God is a capitalist, folks. He is not a socialist. The Ten Commandments, right? Two of them speak to capitalism. Um, uh, you know, one of them basically says you have the right to private ownership of property. Thou shalt not steal recognizes your right to own property as an individual. Socialism is against that, totally against it. The state will confiscate your property and will redistribute it as we think best. That's not biblical. And then the second of the Ten Commandments says you will not lust after what your neighbor has, his goats, his wives, or whatever it is. It's his stuff. And that's, of course, what spawns socialism is envy. Again, man is no damn good. They just want something else. They're envious. They're jealous, spiteful. They have vituperation. They're envious. So capitalism, I, I got the exception. You know, some of these liberals say, well, what about the book of Acts where all the early Christians shared all their property? It was just one big socialistic uh, love fest. No, that was an exception to the rule. The general rule was stated in the Bible very clearly. In fact, uh, Paul stated it clearly in the New Testament, get a damn job. <laughs> right? Second Thessalonians, First Thessalonians, you don't work, you don't eat because we had loafers that were trying to push this flower child idea. Well, you got something, give it to me, brother. Uh-uh, that's not biblical. But there was a one-time collection that Paul took up for the believers in Jerusalem because if you were a believer in Jerusalem, you were a Jew, you were excommunicated from the synagogue, no one would buy anything from your business, and you couldn't sell anything because they wouldn't sell you anything. Because they kept very meticulous records on every Jew. They knew your daddy, your granddaddy, it's like in the Old South, they knew everything about you. And you would starve to death. That's why Christianity spread out very quickly from Jerusalem because they got out of town. So that was a one-time exception to the rule, and God can make one-time exceptions. But the general principle, he is a capitalist. He embraces capitalism all the way. Capitalism brings prosperity. Privacy is a pillar that brings prosperity. The other pillar is the family unit. It's not Adam and Steve. It's Adam and Eve. 
The nuclear family is where you raise your children. That's it. Parents are responsible. That's why I laugh at my conservative friends. We want parents school. I don't want parents school. That's your job in the family. I don't want my kids bowing down 16 times to some Jehovah's Witness or Allah or whatever it is. What are they going to teach my kids in school about God? That's your job. My kids go to school to learn how to read and write. I will do that myself at home. Thank you very much. Because who's the nut job that's going to leave the prayer? Think about it, folks. Do you really want prayer in school? I don't. And I'm more conservative. I'm so, I'm a blue dog. I'm so blue, I'm purple. The tea party's too liberal for me. Let me just put it that way. But think about what they're doing. It's your job to train your kids. It's not the state's job. Your job. I don't want prayer in school. I'll do that at home. In fact, I got to deprogram my kids when they come from public school anyway. I got to tell them about the real heroes of American history and the real story of Abraham Lincoln and the real this and the real that. So if you're not deprogramming your kids when they come home, I give you an F. Unless they go to my class, then you're okay. I'll take care of it for you. But most of the public schools are awash with propaganda, left-wing propaganda from A to Z, including their idea about God, quote unquote, and being some type of a socialist or being some type of a Santa Claus. Well, if you're just good enough, he'll let you into heaven. No, he won't. God's absolute perfection. That's his great math problem. How do I let a sinner into, he into heaven? Adam and Eve did one sin out. I can have nothing to do with imperfection but condemn it. But of course, he solved the math problem by providing this great solution. You believe in the coming Messiah that will die for your sins, and you'd say, I'll take it, and boom, you're in, you can never get out. That's why Robert E. Lee said, I can only say that I'm a poor sinner, trusting in Christ alone for salvation. He got it. Abraham Lincoln, he's the only person I know of that became a Christian after he died. <laughs> you can read his writings to your blue in the face. Now, he can use the God word. He's a politician, but there's no indication whatsoever in any of his writings that he was a born-again believer, understood grace. So, um, just, you know, this is just food for thought because we're thinkers here. We're strict constructionists. So the family unit is the, is the fundamental pillar where kids are supposed to be inculcated with these things. But, of course, I'll agree with you. If the parents don't know squat, the kids aren't going to know squat. Right? Right. And what's the last pillar? The last pillar is nationalism. God is not an internationalist, and our culture worships at the altar of internationalism. Oh, my golly. Um, how do we know God's a nationalist? Well, what's the first international organization in history? The Tower of Babel. Again, he struck that bad boy down because power corrupts. If you have a one-world government, you will have tyranny. What ensures freedom somewhere in the world is nationalism, where people can go to a country that has these concepts of nationalism. I don't care about the rest of the world, frankly. I care about this country. What's good for this country? And other countries, I understand, for example, the Syrians have problems. Hey, do what my great-great-granddaddy did from North Carolina. Get your gun and do something about it. I'm sorry your country's a basket case. Not my problem. Not my problem. Sorry. Uh, fight for your freedom, because the lie is with the Syrian incident, 80% um, of these guys are able-bodied males, unmarried. They're cowards. First of all, why would you even want them in your country? They're yellow bellies. They're not going to fight for their own country. And if you're a do-gooder, you could spend the same dollar we help out these people by building safe zones over there and help out 10 times as many. But it's all about there's another agenda going on, obviously. So our founders recognize these principles, and they also recognize the principle of secession. On my pickup truck, I have a bumper sticker that says secede. Now, I don't advocate secession, but I love to rattle the cage of these people <laughs> to remind them that they work for me. I don't work for them at all. And, of course, I think I'm probably the only law professor in the country that has a secede bumper sticker on his truck. Um, but that's the whole fun. And I love to wave that flag. Uh, in Texas, a few years ago, we had uh, Governor Perry was running for re-election. He was, he, I think he was the longest serving governor in the history, history of Texas. He was running against Kay Bailey Hutchinson, who at the time was a senator, very well loved in Texas. She was ahead by 20 points in the poll. 
Uh, she wanted to run against him. And then Perry came out and did a secession speech about how Texas has the right to secede, dadgummit. And of course, this is when Obama was in office and uh, many people were very uncomfortable with uh, his socialistic ideas. Uh, he went in the poll overnight from 20 point underdog to 20 points ahead and never looked back. It was all over. It was all over. So it is in the DNA, as Dr. Livingston indicated. It, it's somewhere in the DNA. It's in us. Um, and as all Southerners, as, I, as, I, um, as uh, Skeeter, I guess, eloquently said at a, at a talk, he said, what do all Southerners have in common? It's not different styles of barbecue. It's, it's leave us the hell alone. It's in our DNA. And of course, the Confederate flag is, is an issue that I always, uh, uh, you know, people always, I have Confederate flags in my office. Oh my golly, you're a racist. If you fold it up and put it under the bed, they win the argument. It stands for racism. If you fly it higher and you look them in the eye, it's like a dog. They're not going to bite you, folks. If you stand and look at a wild dog, they're not going to do anything. It's when you run from them that they will attack and bite you. Turn around, look them in the eye, and tell them to go to blazes. What they really don't like about our flag, the dirty little secret, they don't care about the racism. Some Yankees are more racist than Southerners. What they really don't like is they know that it stands for limited government and those four pillars I just talked about. My great-great-granddaddy called it liberty. I'm fighting for liberty. My great-great-grandfather, too many greats, my grandfather that fought in the war of northern aggression, we call it the cause, but it's the same concept. We just had a different word for it. I'm fighting for the cause. What cause? States' rights, individual liberty. Now, his granddaddy called it liberty. Same concept. We're fighting for these four fundamental pillars. It's the people that make these things great. And if we don't pass this on to our kids, it's all over. Because it's a strict construction, we can stand up all day long and say, this is what the language really means. They don't care. They really don't care. They don't care what it means. In fact, they hate the Constitution. Liberals see it as a speed bump, as a, as a roadblock to their road to utopian socialism. They don't want to enter into a debate about what it means. Oh, we don't, we don't want to talk about what it means. You know? um, and so that's what they do. And so the Supreme Court is a critical body. There's no question about it. It has morphed into something that has more power than the other two branches of government, really. Uh, every state in the union voted that marriage is between a man and a woman. That doesn't matter. We get these old buzzards sitting up there, and they decided it's something else. And we're too afraid to stand up to them. Got to have your seat belts. We're too afraid because they'll take away the money that we give them back. Tell them to go to hell. We, will, we should not trade our heritage, our rights, for a mess of pottage. Well, then we won't take your money. In fact, how about this? We won't give you any more money. Now, we need to say these radical things. Um, and I could say some really radical things, but I won't because I'm being taped. <laughs> because my military mind has all sorts of solutions on how we could actually secede if we wanted to secede. Because we've got the muscle to do it if we had the will to do it. But I don't advocate secession. It's not that bad yet. But we are on the decline. There's no question about it. So while I could go into all sorts of uh, legal case law, we don't really have the time to do that, I hope I pointed out some fundamental truths to you. And, and, and that's what we need to do. I mean, that's the call to action. That's why this group is so valuable. I salute Dr. Livingston for his work in putting these things together because we need to remind ourselves of these things. We need to get up in their face, and very few people are willing to do it because there's a price to be paid. Oh, you're a hater. You're a this. You're a that. But another thing in closing as a conservative, we really don't care what you think about us. Liberals are always excited. Oh, what other countries think about us? Oh, my golly, what do other people think about us? Life is too short. What we care about is what does God think about us? Are we doing the right thing? And if he says yes, the rest of the world can go to blazes. With that, I will close, and we will take some Q&A. One of the things I learned about the military, you've got to stay on time. And I write time on target. Thank you very much for what you do, all of you.